So number three, we're looking at x equals y squared minus one. So what does x equals y squared minus one look like? Parabola looks like that, right? Yeah. Um, and we're looking for the, what does it say? Just the, yeah, the area between that and the y-axis. So we're looking for this area right there. Uh, multiple different ways you can go about doing this one, really. Um, one is you can do it in terms of y, um, integrating from negative one to one, um, or you could do zero to one in terms of y, and then double that since this is symmetric. You could also convert x, e x equals y squared minus one into y equals, and then do it in terms of x, and then just do the upper piece and then double it. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Do you have a preference on which one of those you want to do? Okay. So what did you get when you did y squared minus one? I mean, you get y cubed minus, or y cubed over three minus y, right? And you did. Maybe. One third minus one. Well, and remember that this is, uh, we should be getting something that's positive if we're to the right of the y-axis, is to the left of the y-axis, that's negative. So we're going to make it negative to get the actual value. Um, so we get one third minus one, and then minus negative one third minus negative one. And you put a negative in front of the whole thing. I don't know. I'm sure that's enough parentheses now. Um, and so we end up with negative two thirds minus another two thirds. So that ends up with negative, negative four thirds or four thirds, which appears to be choice A. Perhaps, I don't know. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Other questions that people have? Fifty-seven. Let's see here. Fifty-seven. Really? I have a feeling that that's in the arc length section. Yeah, 57, which is in the arc length section, which is a BC only question. Well, it's both. Yeah, yeah, it's still BC only, yeah. So not 57. We won't do that. You won't know how to do that. Can you do seven? What? 17, please. 17? Not you not asking for 17. Did I do that right? Yeah. I added too many knots. Yeah. <laughs> not you, not. <laughs> And then I'm good, then I'm right every time. Okay, perfect. All right. Woo, this will be a fun one. All right, so we got this, uh, we got this cubic here. This is uh, y equals x cubed. And we got some rectangle here. This is the point C comma zero. This is zero, zero over here. And then this is the point C comma C cubed up here which makes this vertical line, or sorry, this horizontal line, the line y equals c cubed. And we are looking for the, we are looking for the ratio between the area of the rectangle and the area of that shaded region. Um, so first off, what's the area of the rectangle? Yeah. 
Let's see. Time C cube. So C is four. And then finally, I have the shaded region. We take the area of the full rectangle, which is C to the fourth. And we subtract from that the unshaded region down here. So we subtract from that the integral from zero to C of x cubed dx. So that should be C to the fourth minus, well, that's x to the fourth over four from zero to C. Well, that's just what? One fourth C to the fourth. So C to the fourth minus one fourth C to the fourth ought to be three fourths C to the fourth. So what's the ratio between the rectangle and the shaded region? C to the fourth, be three fourths C to the fourth. Uh, the C to the fourth can cancel out, so that's one to three fourths. One to three fourths is not an option. They even want these as whole numbers, so that becomes four to three. You just multiply both sides by four. Good. Josh, you good with that? Yes. Wait, so the integral is for like the unshaded part, correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. And then it's the full rectangle minus that unshaded part gives us the shaded part. Yep, got it. Thank you. Wonderful. No problem. Other questions? Yeah. If you just wanted to find the shaded part on its own, you could have done this. You could have done an integral of the upper function, which is c cubed, minus the lower function, which is x cubed. But I mean, this first part, the c cubed part, when you integrate that, becomes c cubed times x. And then you're plugging in C, so that just becomes that same C to the fourth. I mean, that's just the, that part is, I mean, that's how this works, right? We find the upper function. When we do that integral, that gives us the whole area of that, which is just the rectangle. So that's why I didn't bother to do that. I just took the bottom piece and subtracted it from the full rectangle. So either way it works. Other questions? People in the Zoom, do we have any more questions? I spent most of the period during period one doing these problems, but now I really don't seem to have as many questions during this class. Uh, 53, please. 53. Oh boy. Okay. Fifty-three. We've got a sphere. With a radius of r. What else does it say here? Sphere with a radius of r is divided into two parts by a plane that is a distance h away from the center. So I'm going to cut this here. We are looking for the volume of the smaller section. So we've cut this at h. So we want to find the volume of this. You know, chunk of this sphere that's over here, which means um, we need to write an equation for the top half of this circle. What's the equation for the top half of this circle? We put this on a coordinate axis like we normally would. What's that equation? Y equals the square root of, what's the equation of a semicircle? Square root of r squared minus x squared. If you don't know the equation of a semicircle, you need to know the equation of a semicircle. All right, so we are going to take this region, a portion of this region, and revolve it around the x axis, because that's just the upper portion of this. So if I take the portion from here, from here to here, right, this chunk right here, and revolve that around the x axis, 
that should give us that volume, okay? And so where am I revolving from? What is this first distance? What is this point here? H. What is the point all the way over? R. Pi times the integral from H to R of the radius, the radius of the cross sections, which are just the height of the function, squared. Everybody good with that setup or no? So we end up with pi times an integral from H to R of just R squared minus X squared. R squared's integral with respect to X is R squared X and then minus X cubed over three from H to R. And then plug in your R and your H, you got pi times R cubed minus R cubed over three minus R squared H minus H cubed over three and then simplify. So R cubed minus R cubed over three ought to be two thirds R cubed minus the R squared H. Oh, that should be a, I don't know why I didn't put that in parentheses. That should be a plus. That's minus both of those plus H cubed over three. Is that an answer choice? Pi times two thirds r cubed minus r squared h minus or plus h cubed over three. No, it's not perfect. Um, looks like what they did though is they factored out the pi over three, or they factored out the one third from all of them. So if you factor out the one third, that gives you pi over three times two r cubed minus one minus. minus. Uh, minus three r squared h and then plus h cubed. Looks like that's choice A. Good or no? Yeah. This. Uh, well, you told me that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the radius of the sphere, right, here's my, you know, imagine this is in like a three dimensional coordinate axis here. I mean, this is still, if I think about it flat on here, right, this is the equation of just the top half of this just this is the square root of r squared minus x squared. And so we're taking just a chunk of that function right there and revolving that around the x-axis. And so that's how it should, it's the piece of the sphere, but we don't really have to draw the sphere, we just have to draw the circle on the coordinate axis and revolve it around the x-axis. Does that make sense? Uh, no. Other questions? Fifty four. Fifty four. All right, we got. F of x and g of x intersect at x equals a and x equals b. We got f is greater than g and g is greater than zero. Okay, so f and g intersect at a and at b. What do I want us to find? The volume when the region bounded by the curves is rotated about the x axis. Okay. Um, they're both greater than zero. Yeah. Okay. So let me just sketch this out. Here's 
is F and here is G. And F is above G. F is always greater than G. So if we're going to take that region and rotate it around the x-axis, that's just um, that's just our washer method, right? So that's the outer radius. Outer radius is f of x. Inner radius is g of x. So that would be pi times an integral from a to b of f of x squared minus g of x squared dx. No, it's just the washer method, though. So it looks like that's the, I guess that's choice A. Yeah, it's choice A. I mean, they wrote it as two separate integrals. But, yep. Um, so the answer choice is? Uh, yeah, was, it's not, actually A is not it because A, they didn't put the pi on there. So. Looks like that should be D actually. They put it inside absolute values. No, those aren't absolute values. Those are just brackets. Those are brackets. No, those are brackets. It, from how far away I was looking, it looks like absolute values. So yeah, it looks like it's choice D. Yeah. F, F of X squared minus G, which is exactly what I wrote. I just, gosh, yeah. They look like absolute values from two feet away where the book is sitting. I guess I need to go to the optometrist. So if answer choice A put the pi in front of the second integral, would that be correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. The exact same thing then. Other questions? Could you go over number 14? 14, sure. Uh, 14 is a BT only question, so you don't need to know how to do 14. Oops, I meant four. <laughs> ah, four. That's different than 14. Um, okay, four. What do we got? We got y squared equals x. So that's just a parabola. X equals y squared. And then what's the line? X plus y equals two. So that's just this. Enough. Okay, um, and what do we want to find? We want to find the area of this region in between. Uh, so probably we would note that what's the best way to do this one? Probably best to do this one in terms of why? Why? Because uh, for every y value that we choose the linear piece is always to the right of the parabolic piece. Whereas um, there's not always one function that is above the other function for the entire region. So we're gonna do this in terms of y, which means we're gonna first need to find the intersection points. So if x equals y squared, and that's what it was mean, x equals y squared, then we can say that y squared plus y minus two, y squared plus y equals no, no, minus two equals zero right and then we can solve that to figure out the y values at which they intersect so what do we end up with there we end up with a plus two and a minus one so they intersect at y equals negative two and y equals one so we're going to integrate from negative two to one the rightmost function which is x plus y equals two so that will become what x equals two minus y minus the other function, which is minus y squared dy. Good with the setup there? Yes. And then you just uh, integrate two y minus y squared over two minus y cubed over three from negative two to one, so you get two minus a half minus a third minus negative four minus two minus eight thirds. And I don't know, whatever that comes out to be. What does that come out to be? Uh, 
whatever 15 halves plus seven thirds is. Um, and that'd be something. Does that make sense though? Everyone good with that? Um, why did you integrate with the y in terms of y? Uh, we chose to do it in terms of y because for every y value that I choose in that region, like any y value you pick, there's always one function that is to the right of the other one. Like the linear piece is always to the right of the parabolic piece. Whereas if we tried to pick every x value, sometimes for the x values, the upper function and the lower function are both the same. They're both the parabola. So we choose to do it in terms of y, where the rightmost function is always the same and the leftmost function is always the same. OK, thank you. Yep. Other questions on that one or other questions in general? Any other questions from that multiple choice? Y'all sure? No more questions? I'm closing the book. Once I close the book and throw it on the ground, that's it. <laughs> okay, so um, we have lots of time left, which is good. So let's, what, what I say, we're going to do the miscellaneous ones, right? That's what I said we were going to do this week. Did I ask you to do any of those specifically? I don't think I did, right? Because I was taking my child to deal with his stuff that he had to deal with, getting getting his vaccination. All right, let's uh, let's start here with this one. I'll give you guys 15 minutes to work through it, and then we will go through it. Sound good, everyone? People at home, you can see that. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, you have 15 minutes to do this. Ready? All right, h prime of two. Well, they gave us um, the fact that this line is tangent to h at x equals two. So h prime of two ought to just be the slope of that tangent line, which is two thirds. Part of a should have been pretty easy. Yeah. Part b. Now uh, this was only one point. Part b. They gave us this function a of x, where a of x is 3x cubed h of x, and we wanted to find a prime of x. So to find a prime of x, we need to use the product rule. 3x cubed h prime plus 9x squared h of x. Make sure you write out the expression for a, a prime of x, because they asked specifically for that. Don't plug in twos immediately. Okay. This expression was worth two points. Then finding a prime of two was worth one point. So a prime of two should have been, what is that? Uh, 24 times h prime of two, which was two thirds. And then what's that? 36 times h of two, which was four. And what did that come out to be? What is that, 86, uh, 160? And that was worth one. Everybody get with that? Everyone's good with A and B? No. Part C might be where you started to have a little bit of trouble. I think A and B should have been pretty straightforward. Easy four points there. Part C, we know that um, H of X, or that H satisfies that H of X is X squared minus four for over one minus F of X cubed when X is not two. And we know that we can find the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x using L'Hopital's rule. So what does that tell you about the numerator and the denominator of this at x equals 2? Should be, they should both be 0, right? It's indeterminate, 0 over 0. So that tells me that 1 minus f of 2 cubed needs to equal 0. So we'll start with that. 1 minus f of 2 
cubed needs to be zero. So f of two cubed needs to be one. So f of two needs to be one. Everybody go with that? Okay. Um, that was just one point right there for knowing that f of two is one. Now we need to find f prime of two. Um, so we know that we need to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom of this. So what's the derivative of the top going to be? 2x. And what's the derivative of the bottom? It's 1 minus f of x cubed, right? So the 1 goes away, the negative f of x cubed becomes negative 3 f of x squared, and then f prime of x. Yeah? And what does this limit need to equal? Four needs to equal four, right? Because h of two is four. And this function is differentiable. And if this function is differentiable, it must be continuous. And if it's continuous, the value of the function must equal the limit of the function. Okay? So we know that this needs to equal four at x equals two. So that gives us four over. What is this? Negative three times f of two squared. So that'd be just negative three times one squared times f prime of two. Everybody go with that. And what did you get for f prime of two? Should be f prime of two is negative one third. Everybody good there? I hope the rest of that was worth three more points. One point for setting this limit equal to four. Um, and uh, I think we know. So one point for setting the limit equal to four, one point for correctly taking the derivative using L'Hopital's rule, and one point for the final. Yeah, one, two, three. Good. Everybody go with that. And then part D says we know that g is less than or equal to h for x between 1 and 3. And we have some other function k that is sandwiched between g and h for 1 to 3. We want to know if k continuous at x equals 2. Well, um, first off, we know that both g and h are differentiable functions. And we know that they are both then continuous functions, which means that every single value between one and three must exist for g and for or the g and h for g and for h and so if k is going to be between those if g and h are always continuous k has to at least be defined for all of those values right um, and specifically at two it needs to um as well and so since you know that's the value that we're looking for at two that tells us that it must be continuous at two as well, just because the nature that all these functions are already continuous. And the values of k must be between the values of g and h, and therefore that must that value there must also exist. The limit must exist there. And if the limit exists and, and we know that the function exists, then it must be continuous. So you just write something out for that. It makes sense. And that was worth one point. Good or no? Yeah. You would have just known that it was defined, but not necessarily. Well, you would have known it was continuous at that point, still, because they gave you, if they didn't give you the value of g of 2, if they didn't, if they just said that g was a twice differentiable function, yeah, then that wouldn't, I mean, that would still tell you, that would still tell you it's continuous. Is that your question? Is? If something being differentiable guarantees that it's continuous without that specific value, correct? Yeah, without the specific value, because we know that since g and h's value there are both four, that the value of k must also be four. <laughs> k of two must, must be four, because h of two and g of two are both four. Correct. 
Good? All right. Let's see here. Tomorrow, we're going to do some more of the uh, miscellaneous ones. So we're going to skip this one with the tree. If you want to do it on your own sometime, that's fine. But we're going to do this one with uh, the tank and this chart. And then we're going to do this one with the graph and this chart. And we're going to do this other one with the chart. So that'll be their numbers three, four, and five. So I will leave it up to you people in the Zoom if you want to work on those now. You can, otherwise you're good to go. Same with you people here. You're not good to go. But yeah. Somebody, that was it for somebody. Somebody was done. <laughs>